Hey everyone, this is Parthi from Letterdrop. Welcome to our podcast where we talk to folks on how to approach go to market differently in 2024. The market's changing and playbooks from the last decade aren't quite going to work anymore. And so we're really excited to talk to folks who are really thinking about um, how they want to evolve go to market. Today um, on the pod, we have Olga Karanikos. Um, she is the CMO of Sales Screen joining us today. And I reached out because Olga, you you have some like really interesting insights into um, how you're approaching your go to market this year um, at Sales Screen. Um, I think I saw you on LinkedIn first. You were on Pep's podcast, and you talked a lot about um, not just account based marketing, but account based engagement, how to do it in a scrappy way. And um, so, really excited to dive in uh, deeper there and understand how you're thinking about go-to-market seal screen, why you think it's the right motion um, for you and what kinds of um, companies should be thinking about emulating your approach to um, marketing in this environment. Uh, maybe what we could do is have you introduce yourself to the audience, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, yeah, I'll let you take it from here. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Parthi. It's great to meet you. and. Yeah, um, my name is Olga Karanikos. I'm the CMO at Sales Screen, as you said, and um, I've been in the SaaS world for some time now, marketing for some time, but started my career with a little bit of a flavor in sales. Um, so I do love the marketing side of things and really digging into a bunch of uh, new strategies, new activities that are abound right now in the industry. I find it super exciting to be in right now. Amazing. So something I noticed, um you talk about is kind of your your big bets um, at Sealed Screen this year. Tell me a little bit more about how you're thinking about um, go to market right now at Sealed Screen. Um, what are the plays you're running, and why are you running that? Sure, I think one of the ways that marketing is transitioning is really more of a reliance on sales and marketing alignment than ever before. Those two. Departments can certainly work in silos, but you get much more benefit from working together. And that being said, it's also a relationship that has been fraught for many years over how to work together effectively. Um, so that's why I really put one of the big bets on ABE, as we call it, or account-based engagement, um, to really be something that we can focus on together and tag team as a go-to-market motion. Uh, one of the key things to really starting off very strong strategic alignment between sales and marketing is just working together and starting small. Uh, so that is why we work on a sort of scrappy basis with our program for right now, just starting with the fundamentals. Um, so it's really about stripping all of the bells and whistles down that can go into ABM or ABE and starting from somewhere. And the reason that I really want to work on just key accounts, you know, really work on things together is it's becoming tougher and tougher to really track every engagement, every activity. Uh, so this way we can keep sort of our, our world a little bit tighter and see things much more concretely on what's working, what's not, um, and digging in by having the research from the sales side as well. You know, what do you know about these accounts? What kinds of messaging can we play into that are really going to resonate with them? Um, so we're, we're kind of working on uh, those foundational elements to just drive that alignment so we can continue to phase into more and more sophisticated efforts um, and, and continuing to grow the program from there. Gotcha. And so it sounds like you're part, part of your motivation behind this sort of um, account-based engagement approach is learning, right? It's data collection. You mentioned, hey, like we don't want to spread ourselves thin. We want to really try to figure out how do we collect more data and understand like what's working, what's not working. What are other um, sort of vectors or characteristics of your business that make this a good approach? Things like ACV, account size, sales cycle length, um, how these people like to be approached, et cetera. Sure. I think it works really well for us because we are going after enterprise accounts. Um, and we define enterprise starting at about a thousand employees and above, but we do cap out at some point. So not the super major enterprises, um, but also the ICP we're going after is 
focused on insurance, fintechs. Um, we have many other uh, industries we work in as well, but starting from that part of our ICP, uh, ABE really makes a lot of sense because these are companies that tend to have one headquarters, many, many branches. Um, a lot of times they may or may not work in sync. They have offices that have sales teams, some that don't. So tackling that kind of uh, environment, it makes sense to really dig in and try to understand those accounts and really understand which offices are we going after? Where is that sales leader based? Are they running teams remotely across many branches? Is that branch um, siloed? So there's sort of a lot of information there you can't data collect on easily uh, from a marketing perspective for sure. So getting that intel from the sales team as they continue to prospect and research and identify how those accounts work, that's all intel we can get um, and really understand where should we leverage all of our efforts and, and get the most bang for our buck. Got it. And um, this is really interesting, um, especially because you're being fairly lean about it. Um, I was talking to Mason Cosby. He runs Scrappy ABM. Mm -hmm. uh, and he talks about how, like, hey, like you don't need an expensive ABM solution like Sixth Sense or Demand Base to get started with ABM. So tell me, what does ABM or account based engagement in your case actually look like? Like very practically, what does it look like? What are the prerequisites or like what are the things you did before in terms of sales marketing alignment? What are the actual campaigns um, tactically on a day to day basis? What do they look like? Sure. And I'll say we're actually working with Scrappy ABM. So oh, nice. Very cool. They're, they're fantastic um, and love all of Mason's work. So one thing that we do focus on very, very closely is the content. It all starts from there um, and really making sure that we have content that is going to resonate, that enables all of the touch points, that we have the right conversation pieces uh, to put out there. Um, so we really started from there. And that's also why we picked one industry or vertical, just to make sure that we can go a bit deeper into that content and line it out you know, by funnel stages, as anyone would in a marketing sense. Um, and then the channels and the distribution for that, we are keeping pretty tight. Um, and the reason being, we want to find the channels that allow us to really target effectively. Um, so we're putting big bets on LinkedIn. Um, it is one of the areas where we can really pick the, you know, down to the person, of course, that we want to go after, um, but really making sure that we triangulate accounts effectively and can do that en masse, um, you know, and, and be able to deliver all of that thought leadership at the right time to the people at those accounts that we're trying to get in front of. Um, at the same time, we do have our sales reps prospecting, um, cold calling, doing all that outreach. Um, but as we get further sophisticated with those accounts and kind of moving them through our ABE program, um, we get more personalized on all of those touch points. Um, and a lot of the outreach that the sales team is doing starts to get more personalized for um, each one of those tactics. So they might start getting into sending LinkedIn video messages or uh, you know, sending gifts. Uh, so we start to really identify which accounts we want to spend that uh, extra effort on. Got it. Um, walk me through what this experience looks like as one of your prospects, right? So let's say I'm part of one of these target accounts you're going after. Um, what is the ideal sort of like journey from my perspective that you're trying to, you're trying to create for me? Yeah. My hope is that that prospect starts to hear about us through LinkedIn. Um, that just starts to see our content whether it's from me posting, from someone else posting, from them receiving a thought leadership ad, from them becoming familiar with the brand, um, that they see content that's all helpful to them, that they find actionable content. Um, and then at the same time, they're starting to get to know our particular rep that is reaching out to them and they tie that person to the brand and to all of that helpful thought leadership that they are seeing. Then they would experience from that outreach, from that rep, even more actionable items, more ideas, things that they can take away right away and use. And, you know, eventually they're starting to get to the point that, okay, they certainly know their stuff eventually that that person is hopefully in the market to buy a product like ours and then they're going to respond now that's always a bit of the the catch with abe is you don't know right away if they are ready to buy and so we kind of tear things out 
you know, are we seeing signals? Are we not seeing signals? How much more effort should we put in? Um, and that's a little bit of that sort of in-between case where we're pulling various levers depending on where that person is. I wanted to talk about content. So how are you getting this content in front of, uh, in front of these prospects? So you mentioned thought leadership ads, who's at, who's, whose content are you boosting via thought leadership ads? Do, do you have a prescribed way in which you're connecting with these prospects so that they actually start seeing your stuff in, in your feed? Um, is it coming from you? Is it coming from your CEO? Is it coming from the sales reps? Um, and how do you decide on what types of content to, to put in there? Yeah, right now we've been very focused on the content that's coming from our CEO. Uh, and those ads have been um, really effective. And I think that's twofold. You know, we are going after our, our ICP is sales leaders. Um, leaders love to hear from other leaders. So we're running ads from both our CEO and from our VP of sales. Um, that are really focused on what their experience is as sales leaders themselves. Uh, so we're finding a lot of success with that. So we would have those ads running as well as those people having those um, executive connections. So they'll go and follow others as well that are within our target account list. Gotcha. gotcha. Cool. And do you do outreach from the exec accounts or do you do them from the seller's accounts? We do both. Uh, so it really is sort of triangulating those accounts as well. So we do look to do um, executive touch points as we get further down the funnel, but we certainly start from the AEs. Uh, so they are the ones making those connections. As they're making connections to people, we'll take those from LinkedIn Sales Navigator on the marketing side, see all the connections that are being made, make sure that those folks are getting put into our ad funnel um, and continuing to, to touch bases on those points on those angles. How are you thinking about what signals you want to be using to understand if somebody's worth reaching out to? Um, or is it account uh, visits on website? Is it engagement with ads? Like how are you, how are you determining that like, hey, like this person's kind of like warmed up for us to outbound to? Yeah, definitely all of the above. So we would start from the account selection standpoint. So we do use uh, some ba basic intent signals right now just to help us pick some of those accounts. And we'll use G2 intent as well. Um, so the great thing about G2 intent is, is certainly they're, they're driving more towards our actual brand already. So that's a pretty strong signal. Um, but prior to that, we'll use Zoom info uh, and just get some very basic, you know, knowledge of what kinds of relevant terms they might be looking at. Um, so we start from there. And then as we drive forward, those account engagements on our ads are certainly important. And I think those are just directional. So that helps our AEs understand, okay, the people on this account are engaging. They've already seen the brand. They're getting a bit of our story. I can now kick off from that standpoint and continue to tell that story. Um, and as we get further down, we are certainly watching who is on the website, you know, have those accounts made it onto the website. That's certainly another very, very strong signal. Um, and then we continue to drive from there with more of the tactical side from the AEs. How, have they responded to any of your outreach? Um, you know, are you getting any traction that way? Did they connect? Did they accept your LinkedIn connection and, and using all of those directional efforts as we go further down? Gotcha. And in terms of, um, the AEs and their outreach themselves, uh, how do you think about AEs being the sharers of content essentially? Like how, like, so typically start, I, I don't tend to accept uh, invitation requests from AEs and SDRs just because um, I anticipate almost getting uh, like pitch slapped essentially. And so I'm curious as to how, how you're thinking. Yeah, Olga, um, I was essentially asking like, how do you think about making your, uh, increasing the reply rate for your, for your AEs uh, essentially? Like how, how do you make sure that there are people that people want to connect with and people want to respond to? Because I think that's a big problem in the industry right now. It's just that a lot of people are wary of of like cold DMs and and um, and such. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're all experiencing that, right? I, I get hundreds of outreaches a day, get a bunch of LinkedIn connections. I think it definitely helps to have a presence already. Uh, a lot of times, it starts with the brand. So if I'm familiar with the brand, I'll accept most of the time. Um, I like to accept a lot just because I, I hate sort of denying when people are making those efforts. Um, but I'm not normal. A lot of people will decline. And, and so what we want is definitely to have that brand already warmed up for people so that they're more likely from that standpoint. 
Um, having our AEs starting to social sell is definitely an area we're looking to improve and grow into because I think it is very important that someone's already familiar with that person themselves as well and has seen some of their content, believes in what they're talking about, and knows that they're knowledgeable about their subject. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on our side, for example, our BDR and AE, like b- before they started social selling and post social selling, we saw like a uh, an 8% increase in connect rate, uh, a 12% increase in reply rate, exact same activity, exact mm-hmm. same type of like messaging, just by getting them to actually be social selling and for getting them to actually be people worth connecting with, right? So if they're posting that content, some of that content you mentioned that your VP of sales and um, execs are posting, if they start posting that kind of stuff on their own accounts um, and they become sort of these sources of thought leadership, Um, it makes it much easier for people to want to connect with them. And so we've seen a massive improvement from just getting um, sellers to actually not just be spammers, but actually uh, consultants in public, essentially. Absolutely. I I think that is certainly a a lever to pull and to, to increase. And I think that comes on the back of the general brand awareness as well, too. It's very tough to give, you know, one AE the responsibility of kind of so, social selling on behalf of the company. So I think it pairs really well with all of the efforts across the board. You know, is your main handle providing actionable uh, thought leadership style content, not just pushing the product? Um, and how does that align with the conversation that your AEs are leading, that your CEOs and executives are leading as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that it's, it's one of those areas where marketing and sales have to really align, like sales needs mm-hmm. enough um, sort of like ammo to be able to say like, hey, like here's, here's stuff that, um, that we think would be educational to our buyers, um, being able to share it, being able to add their own spin to it um, and coming off as authentic and thoughtful online just makes it so much easier for them to connect with people um, versus the 99% of sellers who are um, just kind of going through the motions and um, just like, pasting in a partially AI generated message and and trying to get a response. Absolutely. I would add to one of the uh, additional elements that I'm just thinking of that we certainly bring into our ABA program are events. Um, So we make sure to go to events where we know our prospects on those lists are going to be. Uh, So when we're looking at the insurance industry, for example, we're hitting a lot of the insurance heavy events, um, some regional just to make sure we're really honing on on exactly where they will be. So that way we can also have the face time. So that face recognition can certainly work wonders. Having a person to person conversation and interaction um, a lot of times will outweigh anything else you can do online. Yeah, I think especially if you have like a target account list, um, suddenly identifying like, hey, which conferences or um, physical events our buyers are going to be um, makes it much easier for you to go and build those kinds of relationships. At the end of the day, like even um, post COVID, and I know a lot of people are remote now, it, it like having that face to face relationship just um, gives you an edge in terms of your ability to sell. Something that you've mentioned previously was uh, you don't care about attribution. And what I took that to mean is uh, you agree that I agree that sales and marketing shouldn't squabble over credit. Like was the lead an out inbound lead? Was it an outbound lead? It doesn't really matter. Um, what's, what matters more is that marketing and sales are working together to actually get that meeting booked. However, I do think that attribution matters from a, from like a data perspective to understand what were the touch points or what were the actions which eventually got uh, this person to book a meeting with you. And can we actually replicate that moving forward? Can we stop doing the things that are not working and double down on the things that are working? Um, does that align with what you, you're you thinking when you say attribution doesn't matter or, or am I wrong there? No, I, I completely agree. And I think when I look at it from an attribution standpoint, it depends on your model. We, we tend to use an attribution model that's more last touch and that tells so little of the story. Um, so I like to keep attribution just from, let's say, an MQL standpoint, a demo request that comes into the website. Of course, I want to know what converted them. And that's what we use attribution for in our world. Um, but when it comes to ABE, we know that that's a, 
a strategy that is involving so many different touch points and so many different efforts. Um, so 100%, it's not about the credit or even what is that last conversion. I don't want to put weight on that last conversion in that sense because there are so many touch points that are actioning all of these movements along the way. Um, so it does become much more of a bit of a data mess, honestly. You know, it's tough to really watch everything that happens, what's moving things, what's not moving things. Um, sometimes it's about pulling elements out and seeing if it makes a difference. Other times it's really investing a lot of time and energy into finding the right ways to track all those metrics um, and see which levers are there to double down on. Um, so I think I just see ABE very differently because attribution kind of goes out of my mind and then it's really about just digging into the data to see what is it that helped um, and what what um, actions are really driving steps through through that process. Yeah, totally agree. Um, even at Letter Drop, what we do is we try to actually understand what the buyer journey looks like. And we know a lot of our inbound. So our inbound largely comes from two places. One is like Google and the other is LinkedIn. Um, a good chunk of it is actually my LinkedIn. I think 64% of our inbound is is basically my LinkedIn. And so... For us, it's really about tracking everything from engagement, comments, likes from those LinkedIn posts, um, pages, different accounts are visiting on our website um, to like, what are they asking on sales calls and what are they consuming post first call, right? Like there's still an element of education um, and room for content and uh, after a person has first been demoed. Um, before they actually close, either close one or close lost. And so I think it's really important to for companies to actually understand what that journey looks like and then see like, hey, like, what are the touch points or what elements happened through a journey of a close one customer or a close lost customer and trying to identify patterns in there and being like, oh, you know what? When somebody consumes or like reads this case study um, or... Um, we talk a lot about this topic on LinkedIn. We're seeing a larger correlation with close one for these types of customers. So we should probably be investing more of our time and energy in kind of repeating that buyer journey for folks, as opposed to kind of spreading ourselves thin um, and working on a whole bunch of things, many of which might not be working historically once we've given stuff a shot. Now, this is not an excuse to not try new things. I think in marketing and sales, like you always want to be investing some of your resources and exploring and trying something new because otherwise you're just going to sort of like micro optimize on something. Um, but at least like having that data to know, okay, like I can free up my time um, to take new bets as opposed to spreading myself thin on like these 70% of campaigns or assets, which don't seem to be ever touching um, revenue. Yeah. And one of the, and you bring up an interesting point that's sort of post opportunity, right? So some of the hardest part is bringing those people into our sphere. And then once we do see that opportunity and the AE is working it, um, we use digital sales rooms, yep. which is really effective in telling us what content they're engaging with. And, and I do the same. I like to dig in and see, you know, what is it they're actually reading? What content are they not picking up on? Um, you know, if we see a particular conversation happening after reading a specific content piece, we double down on that. Um, so it is really valuable information. And I think that is something that a lot of marketers don't think about, or we don't kind of put into our mindset because it's post opportunity, but in a world where we're all working towards revenue and not just leads, uh, that's really vital information and getting all of that bottom of funnel content to your sales reps in a way that, um, ideally is trackable, but is, you know, just readily available to that executive to read on their own time versus relying on like when that conversation is happening with the AE is really important. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, at sales screen, what are you metric on? Is it revenue pipeline MQLs? Like what is the, what is the number you're trying to really drive pipeline and revenue? Uh, pipeline. those would be my ultimate North star metrics and what we're, um, metric on, but underneath that, we look at so many other things. And I would say that the next key metric is definitely MQLs. So we use MQLs directionally right now, um, but pipeline of revenue is our ultimate goal. Got it. Got it. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Not enough marketers or marketing leaders, especially 
our metric on revenue and pipeline. And I think um, if you see sales and marketing bickering, um, as you kind of like earlier alluded to, it's mostly just because they're looking at different numbers. And, um, and that's why a lot of people have these issues where they're just like, Hey, like we're not on the same page and we're optimizing for very different numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a thing you mentioned, so you, you've talked about this AB, ABE, ABM type program. You mentioned that you're starting to also think about product led sales, mm -hmm. which is very, very different from like what you're doing right now. How are you thinking, why are you thinking of introducing this? And how are you going to balance these two? I imagine the approach you're going to take for product led is going to be very different from like these hundred target accounts for enterprise. Yeah. I think the impetus for us is the feeling that we see our prospects get once they see our product and once they experience it. Um, and we just want to leverage that and get that in the hands of our customers faster. Uh, but we are a company that started on a sales led motion and it is a tool that can do a lot that can get pretty complicated. So we want to guide the conversation for sure and not take the sales element out entirely. Um, so that's why we're looking at mashing the two motions. We want all of our prospects to be able to get their hands on the product, try it out, see it for yourself. We're very confident they're gonna have that aha moment um, and want to talk to sales or want to learn more or you know, dive into like the further customizations and abilities of our product. So we're taking it a step past you know, some of the tools that typical product marketers would bring into play. You know, there's always, of course, product tours you can put on the website and we're, we're going to do that as well um, as part of this. But we do want to have that free trial option so people can actually get their hands on it and see it for themselves. Um, and what we like about that as well is it's going to give our AEs a stronger conversation to start off of great, you've experienced our product. what do you like about it? You know, where do you see the value? Let me tell you a bit more about these other use cases. Um, so we're really not starting from scratch. Marketing is doing a lot of the work to get people to the point that they're in a buyer state. Gotcha. And how are you thinking about getting people into those free trials in the first place? Like obviously the, the thought leadership ads and the um, outbound approach is not going to be effective there. So how are you thinking about um, how people even learn about you and get in, into that free trial? Yeah, a lot of it will be organic to start. So anybody who comes to the website can find it. We want to put it on our social, make it available. Um, we'll have a lot of product tours up on our YouTube that can then lead to the free trial as well. Um, so we're still focused on generating uh, traffic and demand from just general content marketing and all of our other efforts. Um, and once people get to our sphere, we want to make it available to them right away. So the, the main driver is going to be the website. Um, I do see a world eventually where we will sorry, sh share it through the AEs as well um, and just picking the right time within those conversations to share that. Um, there absolutely should be a use case for, okay, you've heard you know plenty about us. You, you understand exactly what we do, what the value is. Now get in here and try it out and let's talk about what you, what you're experiencing. Sure. Uh, that's, that's really fascinating. So it's more so, um, when you think about content marketing, um, from a PLG motion versus like an ABM motion, what are the differences in types of content you might be producing? It really needs to be more product and use case specific. Um, so what we still don't want to do is just push product. We really want to push the value of the product, the use case of the product. Um, so we, we do sales gamification. One of the key things that um, people look for is competitions. Excellent. Did you know that a lottery competition is a great way to engage you know, all the players on your team? Give it a shot. Um, this is why it's effective. You have all different types of players. Some people are engaged by the thrill. Others are killed, are engaged by the hunt, the achievement. Um, so there's all this content marketing that we can do behind the why uh, a use case is valuable or the why of um, how this is going to engage your employees. So it's, a, a, I would say, a drop below true thought leadership um, because it does mention and talk about the product and how to actually use it. Uh, but it is still focused on that value. And we also want to come up with content marketing that's, all right, you know, if our product is not the right one for you, here's how you set up that competition at home. Um, you know, we want to be helpful at the end of the day. 
so all that kind of content marketing will get a bit more specific. Gotcha. Gotcha. And this is across like your website, like blog posts, YouTube, um, organic social, social. Um, or are you thinking about other channels? Uh, pre predominantly there. Um, we are growing a partner network as well. So we'd love to get to the point that we're also sharing content through partners and use cases. So um, we integrate, so having those shared um, use cases between an integration partner would be really strong as well. So we can leverage all of their organic channels too. Actually, yeah, no, that's fascinating. I think the partner network um, and trying to get others to work with you is, is fascinating. Uh, I'm guessing most of the partners have to be similarly sized for that to be interesting to them. Um, because sometimes when you work with like really large partners, like a Salesforce, for example, they're not very incentivized to be promoting like tinier companies. Absolutely. But the good thing about some of those bigger partners as well is a lot of them will have marketplaces now. Mm -hmm. um, so I can put my content on their marketplace that helps their customers who are also integrated with us. Um, so even if they're quite big and can't do a webinar or, you know, a social um, campaign with us, a lot of times they do open up opportunities as well that where we can share relevant content to their audience. Sure. Well, Olga, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I learned a lot about how to think about um, ABM while being lean or, or rather account-based engagement while being lean. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing a little bit about how you're thinking about your go-to-market at SalesScreen. If anybody in our audience wants to find you online, like what's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn, Olga Karanikos. Uh, feel free to send me a message. Like I said, I'll likely accept. <laughs> <laughs> I love to make connections and love to hear from everybody. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, ha for joining us today, Olga. And uh, thank you for the great episode. Thank you. It was great chatting.